Now that little fish that got off was a moral victory. The reason it was a moral victory is because it was lying here, kiting under this bank. One always imagines that fish are always on the other side. And this is why I'm on my hands and knees to fish for fish like that on this bank. It was a small rainbow trout, but we'll see some more of those later on. Nice rainbow. Come on, fish. Come on, fish. This is a, a, a rainbow trout that took the imperial, a good spring olive imitation, on the Derbyshire wire here. Notice its nice pink flanks and spotted tail. This is one of the few rivers in Britain the rainbow trout breed. Very, very special river for that case. But we're in April now in the hunting season. So what we're going to do is gently release this back to the water. But it's a lovely fish. Just hold it under. And pull him back. There he goes. rainbows in the Y. They're not very big by reservoir standards, but they don't half go if you give them a chance. Now what I'm going to try and do is walk it down to the gap down there where I can more easily net it. So here we go. Come on fish, let's go for a walk. Come on fish. The interesting thing today is that the trout are taking large dark olives and the artificial they're taking is the kite imperial, the fly that we tied earlier on in the programme. What I find amazing is that they're not taking my crew the canard fly, which I rate as being a better fly than the, than the old imperial. Shows you how stupid you can be, I suppose. Just hold him in the water in your net and then just bring him up. Come on, fish. Let him slip out. There he goes. A bit wiser that fish, but not hurt by a little barbless hook. Right, this is a little small brownie that uh, has come out of the river today. And what I'm going to do is to spoon it to see what it's eaten. Now, there's a great deal of, of hogwash talks about catch and release, and I go along with catch and release. But on the other hand, one of the privileges being uh, a game angler is that some of what we eat, what we catch, we can eat, take home and eat. And when we do, then we should always spoon the fish. So this little breakfast trout, it's now going to show us what's in its stomach. And the first thing, this is, this is the late, late afternoon, late in the hatch. The first thing to notice is how little there is. That is its full stomach content. First of all, this is the large dark olive that the trout's eaten. There's another one here. Uh, and that is an imitation of, it was caught in an imitation of that fly. Notice here is a little bit of a remains of a caddis case. And here is a little, little caddis that was in that case. So there's the caddis. But also the under wonderful thing, look here, we've got a housefly. And so this, this trout was not feeling very selective at all. It's also got a housefly in its stomach. And there is the remains of a mayfly nymph, the big mayfly nymph, the ephemera, that we'll be catching on the mayfly program later on in May and June. The rest is a mix, again, of large dark olive. You see the wings there is, another, is uh, the remains of another mayfly nymph there. See how interesting it is? We can, get up, we can see exactly what the species is eating. 
So it's in quite a lot of large dark olives, you can see the remains of the wings. The odd name, the odd may find it, a housefly and a caddis. And there's probably about 45 food items there, which is not very many for an afternoon feeding. When we were to come and look at a similar trout stomach in May, June, July, when there are far more flies hatching, then we'd expect hundreds of, of flies to be in there. And this makes April fishing very difficult because the fish might take four or five items and stop feeding for a while. So we find fish are not consistently on the dry fly at this time of the year, nor on the nymph. Notice one thing, very, very little evidence of feeding on the bottom. A couple of mayfly nymphs and a caddis, and that's all.